All right, let's go Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, if you don't have a Bible, we'll have the text up on the screens behind me in just a little bit. We also have some physical Bibles kind of scattered around the room, the little racks beneath the seats. If you don't own a Bible of your very own, don't have one that you can call yours, we invite you to take that physical one home. The reason for that is incredibly simple. It's really brilliant, I think, actually. We believe that God uses his word for all kinds of important things, but chief among those important things is that he uses it to reveal himself to his people. Like, we want you to know God. We want everything in and about and around your life to be shaped by that knowing of him. And if you don't uh, have a copy of God's word, that puts you at a disadvantage, right? And so uh, we want to put a copy in your hands. There's lots of really free options online. You can probably find much prettier ones other places, but we got a free one. You can have it if you don't have one. Uh, and now, if you do have a Bible, don't take ours. That's kind of a jerk move. But if, if you don't have one, take that one. All right, so we kicked off a new thing last week, uh, kind of uh, studying through the book of Titus together. Uh, Titus is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a, a protege, disciple of his that has become a contemporary of his named Titus. It's really brilliant how we name things in the Christian church, right? Uh, so the letter to Titus gets called Titus. Now, Titus shows up in several places in the life and work of Paul. Though he's never mentioned in the book of Acts, he's mentioned about a dozen times in other places. And by putting the pieces together, we got a pretty good sense that, Paul, that Titus is always kind of around. He's always kind of floating around in the background. Uh, and we, we think that uh, he does a lot of things with Paul. He gets sent some places on Paul's behalf. And then towards the end of Paul, life, he helps Paul to plant a church in the, the, on the island of Crete shortly after the end of the book of Acts. All right? I think Paul gets out of jail when he's, in, he's in, or under arrest. We think house arrest at the end of the book of Acts. We think that he gets out of that house arrest in about two years, and then he leaves Rome. He goes around and travels to a couple of other places, a few other places, uh, for about five years or so. Then Paul is rearrested. He's brought back to Rome, and he's ultimately martyred. All right? And so that little five- to six-year window, uh, we sometimes call it kind of unofficially Paul's fourth missionary journey, uh, but we think that he probably helped to start a brand new church on the island of Crete with his buddy Titus, all right? And so it's probably somewhere around 63 AD if you're interested. All right, so uh, Titus is probably written about the same time as 1 Timothy, all right? We think that probably those letters came out from Paul about the same time, and they're both incredibly similar, all right? Um, they're both written to guys who are disciples of Paul uh, that, that are now serving in kind of pastoral roles, and Paul's writing back to them to give them personal advice and to instruct them on how to solve some, some problems that they're seeing in their churches, all right? That's the tone of both letters. All right? You got some problems in your churches. I'm, I love you. I want good for you. Uh, we've got a history together. Let me teach you real quick how to solve those problems. And the answer that Paul gives to both 1 Timothy and Titus in those two letters is this. Raise up healthy church leadership. That's his point. That's the point of both of those letters. You fix the problems that you're seeing in your church right now by raising up qualified men who teach and who shepherd and who guard, protect the flock. That's what he tells them. We saw last week, we saw last week that Paul hints at that overarching theme in, in, in the letter to Titus by telling Titus, reminding Titus of who he and Paul are in the larger kingdom of God. They're not kings. They don't carry divine right. They're servants. They're slaves, in fact, is what he calls them. They have a God-given authority, but it is a delegated authority. Uh, it is not intrinsic to them. They are stewards appointed to a task. And like every steward ever will, they will one day have to stand before their master. They will have to stand before God and give an account for how they stewarded. Paul says in verses 2 and 3, that church leaders exist for an express purpose of bringing everyone else to the right knowledge of the truth of the gospel. And that right knowledge will naturally produce two other very important things. Godliness in this life and a confident hope in the eternal life to come. That both of those things are byproducts of this right knowledge of the truth. We said last week that the, a right understanding of the gospel must necessarily result in right gospel living. We also said right gospel understanding must necessarily produce a longing for living out a forever righteousness before God's holy presence. If you're not getting both, then we're talking about something other than a right understanding of the gospel. And furthermore, if church leaders are not producing 
those two things, then they're not fulfilling what Paul would identify here in Titus as their God-given mandate. If they have a job to do, it's to produce those two things through true gospel understanding. And if those two things aren't being produced, then there's something wrong somewhere. They're not living up to what God has called them to. We also learned last week that that's not what's going on in Crete. They don't see godliness, and they don't see an eternal perspective. What they see instead is hypocrisy and a nearsightedness, a a focus on this earthly life alone. So we said last week that bad leaders had risen up in Crete precisely because good leaders failed to rise up. Bad leaders had risen up in Crete precisely because good leaders had not risen up. But but that raises an important question for us, right? Like, what, what exactly do good leaders look like? Like, if, if, we, if we know now that they're incredibly important, that they've got this specific God-given job to do, what, what, what do they look like? And, and what do we look for if it's our responsibility to raise them up? Like, like, what should we be looking for? How do we do that? If we are to elevate a certain kind of leader here, what should we be looking for? Is it a, is it a certain skill set? Is it charisma? Is it a business acumen? Do, they, do, do church leaders need to be able to prove, have a history of producing certain results in certain situations? Right? Well, what to look for is exactly where Paul wants to take us next. You ready for it? Good. That's where we're going. I don't have another plan. All right. We're going to look at a whopping one and a quarter verses today. Um, Slightly less than our normal plan of attack, but we got a lot of cover in this little stretch. So buckle up. Ready? Titus 1 verse 5. Let's do it. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. All right, so the reason, Paul says, the reason he left Titus in Crete was to close out one last task so that they could finally consider the Cretan church to be fully planted, fully begun, all right? They started a brand new church. Paul's got to head off somewhere else, and so he goes and does that. He leaves Titus in Crete so he can finish up the last little bit of the to-do list, all right? He's got one last thing to do before they can consider it to be done, firmly planted. So what still remains? Titus is told to appoint elders. Appoint elders. And, And the way Paul frames this, The way Paul frames this, it suggests that this is a glaring need. This isn't some kind of second tier thing that they can, you know, put off to another time. No, no, we we need to get this piece handled or else we're not properly functioning the way that we need to be functioning. There's disorder here. There's things that are not quite up to speed as they ought to be just yet. And so the assumption is buried in what Paul is saying here that this last action will fix every bit of that. There's one one last thing left to do. Titus, that's why I left you in Crete, Titus. Do this one last thing. Raise up, appoint elders. Okay. So what are elders, right? Like that seems like an obvious next question. What are elders? Well, there's actually a good bit of confusion about that. Historically speaking, we could even say here in our own church. Um, Depending upon what church you walked into on a Sunday morning, Uh, You would likely get a very different answer to that question depending on where you are. Uh, It's where our, um, the Greek word there is is the word uh, for elders is the word presbyteros, which is a fun sounding word that sounds like a cough medicine. All right, presbyteros. It's where our Presbyterian friends get the name for their denomination. Presbyteros. Presbyteros is used in a couple of different ways in the Bible. Sometimes it's honestly just used as a way of like describing someone who is older than you, your elders. Mind your presbyteros, right? Most of the time, though, both in the New Testament and in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, most of the time it's used to describe a leader or leaders of a group of people. So Paul, Paul's not talking about appointing a bunch of older saints to some task. No, what he's talking about is creating leaders of the church from within the church. Oftentimes the word elder is replaced in a lot of people's terminologies with the different term, the word pastor. And pastor's a much more common word in our culture, right? Incredibly more common. If, I, if I'm on an airplane and somebody asks me what I do for a living, like telling them I'm a pastor is going to get to the point really, really quick. Definitely faster than telling them I'm an elder. Uh, pastor's much more common in our culture. Um, also, if I'm on an airplane, it's a really quick way to shut somebody up. Right? 
just they'll zip up right now. And usually their language gets a lot cleaner. It's fun. All right. Uh, so if I'm, if I'm interested in getting on an airplane and taking a nap, I will always introduce myself. All right. <laughs> just how that works. All right. So in a biblical vocabulary, in a biblical vocabulary, pastor and elder are the exact same thing. They're interchangeable words. We use the title of pastor more often in our culture, but the Bible uses the title of elders. In fact, the Bible never uses the title of pastor. You don't see pastors in the New Testament. What you see are elders, and elders do the work of pastoring, verb form. So now you might, be, you might begin to understand a little better where the confusion comes in. The debate, the confusion is not over what an elder is. That's not what people argue about. The debate lies in who can be one and how many a church should have and what the process of appointing them looks like. That's where there's confusion. Um, Some people argue that an elder is the same thing as what others would call a lead pastor or a senior pastor. In other words, me, right? Me. Somebody who holds the authority as the leader of a church, right? That's typically what people throw around when they use that word. That, that person has a specific skill set, certain spiritual gifts, and some, probably some special training that identifies them as clergy rather than as some lowly layman, right? That's kind of the, the game we play. And usually that, that's the guy that gets the paycheck if a church is able to, you know, to do something like that in a position to pay someone. Lots of denominational structures hold to uh, this kind of position, especially ones that are like hierarchical in structure, like Methodists and Episcopalians. But, but Baptists have often found themselves holding to this position in a slightly different form. Usually it takes the shape of a senior pastor and some deacons. We have a hierarchical structure too. We may be less formal about it, but it's there. We got one clergy and then some non-clergy, right? A lot of SBC churches point to that model as the way to interpret verse 5. Certainly not all, though. Um, It was the most popular model during a certain time period in history that a lot of churches got started, including ours. Uh, uh, Right now, by my count, and this is just a quick straw poll, but by my count, only about a third of the SBC churches in New Hampshire hold to the senior pastor and deacon's view. We're currently one of them. Then another quarter to a third hold, they're not really big enough to even have an option. They're just like tiny little church plants that are just hoping that anybody will step up as a leader. So they haven't had the luxury of answering the question yet. But that means, that means that another, the other third or so of New Hampshire SBC churches hold to a different position. One that used to be way more common before about 150 years ago. And that has seen a big resurgence today. Uh, There was a shift that occurred in the U.S. at the end of kind of the 19th century thereabouts, uh, that saw several professional classes become more and more professionalized. If you, if you understand that kind of time period in American history, you, 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 you know what I'm talking about. Medicine, law, engineering, higher education, they all went through kind of shifts in their, in their professions that credentialed members of their class as being the experts in the field and created academic and training barriers between the experts and the non-experts, the professionals and the non-professionals, right? Um, Protestant clergy, We went through the same shift. We went through the same shift. I would argue mostly as an attempt to try to keep up with the Joneses. We want our profession to be professional too. Gosh darn it. That's kind of how it went. We want to be seen as professional, please. (laughs) If you're interested, there's a really good book by David Wells called No Place for Truth that chronicles that kind of clergy shift or that, that shift in the clergy class, and he specifically looks at it through the lens of a small uh, New England town. It's kind of a brilliant read. It almost made the pastor's reading list this year. It might make it next year. No place for truth. Now, specialized training, like we all agree that specialized training is a good thing, whether we're talking about doctors who have actually learned how to practice medicine from other doctors, or we're talking about pastor figures who have gone to seminary and now understand the nuances of doctorate and church leadership. Those are good things. Training is great. Training is important. I think more people ought to be trained. But what it is also done, simultaneously done, is create a perception that there's one person in the room that knows what they're doing and everybody else ought to stay out of the way. Right? One expert and no one else knows what they're talking about. Um, gone are the days of the polymath renaissance men who dabbled in a little bit of everything the da Vinci's, the Galileo's, the Isaac Newton's those guys are gone and they're never coming back 
They have no place in a world full of experts. And to be clear, you, you want specialized training when someone is operating on your stomach. Like that's, we all agree that that's a valuable thing. You want someone who has been through a rigorous licensing process when they're building your bridge. Specialized training and expertise are valuable. That, that shift in our culture has also produced a mindset that there's only one person who knows what they're doing. And when that mindset creeps into the culture of the church, maybe we ventured somewhere unhealthy. So a lot of churches over the last hundred years or so, they've, they've leaned more and more into that posture. They've, they've kind of shifted deeper and deeper into the mindset that, that if they don't have the professional pastor figure, that heavily credentialed expert man of God to lead them from the front, then they're somehow incomplete as a church. And so you have, they're in kind of a state of limbo and, and it's out of order and they need a Titus figure or maybe a well-representative search committee to fix the problem for them. Sweep in and find the right guy, which, is, which has resulted in, in some churches, I think, getting into arms races with other churches to try to have the most credentialed guy on the, pe- on the pedestal. It's, why, it's literally why some churches require that their pastor has a doctorate instead of some lowly master's degree. Because they've got to be fed by the best, right? Or else they're not being fed. Or at least more degrees than the church down the road. That way they can look like the intellectual ones. The problem with that way of looking at things, however, is that those formal education pieces, as invaluable as they obviously are, those things didn't exist when Paul wrote this letter. Like those weren't around then. There were no seminaries in first century Rome, let alone in Crete. Um, there were no training programs to, to graduate from. There were no committees and to weigh the achievements of one candidate's resume against another candidate's resume. Those things have been built up since then. There's, those things couldn't possibly have been in view when Paul wrote this letter. If he did, Titus... I was just never going to find one of those guys. They weren't around. So while some churches think of elders as an expert senior pastor figure, other churches read verse 5 as a team of normal men who carry the shepherding responsibility of a church together. Some of those guys may indeed have special training and certain spiritual gifts and skill sets and maybe even some kind, of, uh, some kind of accreditation of people who have affirmed them, especially maybe especially equipped to, to play a role in that leadership. There may be special guys in that group. Some of them may even get a paycheck from the church so they can devote their attention to the work of the church instead of having to focus their attention on a secular job. That's a good thing when a church can pull it off. But whether they're trained or not, whether they're charismatic or not, whether they're on the the payroll or not, they are all part of a larger team of leaders who all bring different things to the table. And those varying skill sets and varying life stages and varying vocational backgrounds and education levels all pour into a combined wisdom and leadership that can cover way more ground than one guy on a pedestal could ever come close to covering. No matter how deep his expertise happens to be. And, and maybe you're thinking, okay, well, I mean, that sounds really nice and reasonable, but is there biblical justification for this? I mean, I don't want pragmatism. Give me scripture, sir. Well, the, the team of elders crowd point to something incredibly simple, but also really, really important here in Titus 1.5 um, to land where they land. They, Paul, Paul tells Titus to appoint elders, plural, Appoint elders in every town as I directed you, meaning more than one. And I believe that that is a common theme throughout the New Testament. Um, In other words, you always hear of elders being referred to in the plural sense. The only time presbyteros is ever used in a singular form in the New Testament is when it's addressing a specific elder of a specific church. But whenever it talks about the office itself, it's always in the plural. Always. Always. 
Now, the singular elder crowd, the, the ones that argue for one guy on the platform, uh, the, the singular elder crowd, like, they like to argue, uh, Titus is raising, uh, raising up elders in all the different towns and house churches across all the different towns in Crete. And so they take that to mean one elder in each of those places. But Paul didn't say appoint an elder in every town. He said appoint elders. Besides, all those little house churches, they still seem to fall under the umbrella of the larger Cretan church. Like there seems to be kind of one family here. We're not, we're not sure how often those, those little house churches kind of combine together into one larger location, one larger gathering, but that seems to be the structure that's kind of laid out here for us. And so even if we want to force, and I think it's forced, even if we want to force a reading that says one in every town, these churches aren't isolated. They're part of a larger church identity that is worshiping together and sharing resources together and I think most importantly making decisions together. Otherwise, otherwise Titus, Titus wouldn't have any authority to actually fix the problem here. Like, if all the towns that Paul is speaking of are completely independent of each other, then Titus is an outside voice that they don't have to listen to. The fact that he has the leadership to settle this last item on the to-do list tells us that there is an interconnectedness with all these little house churches that see themselves as one singular Cretan church family. And so some, certainly not all, some propose that what's going on here is more of a small group structure than an independent church structure. You've got one church in, on Crete and a bunch of smaller satellite groups meeting together in between the moments where they can get everybody together. Now, I don't know how true that is, but it's a pretty solid argument. I don't know. So we got a debate on our hands, right? Like we got... We got people who love Jesus and love the Bible saying one thing. We got another group of people who love Jesus and love the Bible saying another thing. What do we do about it? <laughs> right? Like, what, what should we do? How in the world could we ever begin to parse through all of the debate? I mean, are we just left to trust what really smart people, uh, whatever camp we happen to be in, have said that we should land here, so we'll land there? Is this as simple as denomination A holds to this view and denomination B holds to this view? And I'm, I'm a little bit of a denomination B guy myself, so we're going to land there. I don't know what it means, but we're going to land there. Is that what this, what's going on here? Especially seeing how there are a lot of churches in our own denomination who land in a different place than we historically have on this issue? About the same number in our denomination in New Hampshire as we would hold? So, are there tools available to normal folk like us to figure out what God actually wants for us when it comes to church leadership? I think there are. And I think it's actually laid out for us in the next few verses. If the goal is to find one guy who stands above the rest in skill set and aptitude and gifting and training. Well, the list of qualifications that Paul gives to Titus should probably reflect that, right? They should probably flesh that out. But if, if the goal is to find normal guys who come together as a team, then the qualifications will lend themselves to that dynamic instead, right? And so if Paul's going to give a list of qualifications to Titus, what are those, what are those, what's the shape of those qualifications, and do they give us a hint over whether or not we're talking about one incredibly impressive, talented individual, or we're talking about a bunch of guys who all bring different things to the table? Well, so what does verse 6 say? Let's read it. This is where we get the quarter verse. <laughs> if anyone is above what? Reproach. We're going to stop there for the morning. All right. I promise we'll get to the rest of verse 6 next week. Above reproach. That's a, that's a phrase that we don't use much in our culture anymore, right? I would argue, I may be wrong, but I would argue, it's probably because we don't have a lot of opportunity to use it, right? It means unable to charge with offense. It's how you would describe someone whose life is unquestionably moral and good. They're above questioning, not because they're untouchable, but because you see exactly who they are and you don't bother questioning it. Unable to charge with offense. So, so follow me here. The first thing out of Paul's mouth when giving Titus a what to look for list, it's not skill set. It's not skill set. 
It's not aptitude. It's not training. It's not approval by some credential board. It's not an entrepreneurial spirit. It's not a background in leading organizations of a certain size and a certain budget. And even though it sounds way spiritual, it's not even, well, I really feel God's calling on my life to do X. You know, according to Paul, according to Paul, the most important thing to look for in a potential church leader is quality of character. Quality of character. Do they actually live up to the standards of righteousness for God's people? Does the testimony of their life match the testimony of their mouth? That's the question. Well, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, of course character matters, obviously. Absolutely. We, nobody would ever never doubt that. But, but you know, we, we, what about all the other things that are valuable for a church leader that we should be looking for? I mean, I mean, this is such an important role, being the one guy on top of the pedestal. We better make sure that guy's a five-tool star, right? Five-tool player. Obviously, character is one of the things that needs to be taken into account, sure, but I mean, we really, really need to find a healthy balance between that and the ability to get some things done, right? And I'll admit, that sounds really smart. It sounds like a wise way of approaching things. Churches certainly have a lot of need to get it done kind of moments. It's good to have a guy with that kind of skill set at the reins sometimes. The problem with that logic, though, is that Paul is going to go on in the rest of verses 6 through 9 and spell out what he means by above reproach. He's going to flesh that out. 18 specific things to watch for and make sure are present in the man before you raise them up into the role of a leader. And other than one single solitary skill set item, there's nothing on the list other than character. It's all character and then one little skill set thing. The Apostle Paul doesn't have five tools to look for in a potential church elder. No, he's got one primary tool and then that one skill set that is going to be directly affected by all of those character issues. That's the tone he sets. And I would argue, I would argue that a lot of churches have gotten themselves in a world of trouble over the years precisely because they overlooked glaring character issues and hired a guy that impressed them with their talent and charisma. I've seen it too many times. In fact, it's probably almost every story that you've ever come across of a pastor figure making a mess of things. It's a common scenario, actually. Um, The warning signs were typically there for years. There was a character flaw, and they ignored it because I mean, look at all the success we're seeing. They're so talented at X, Y, and Z. But eventually the default in character caught up to them and it blew up. In a previous church that I served in as a youth pastor, I, I followed an incredibly charismatic guy who was also an absolute train wreck morally. Just completely mess, made a mess of things. Teenagers flocked to the guy. He was, he was an obvious magnet. The youth program exploded. They had a bunch of dozens and dozens of professions of faith. They were baptizing teenagers like every third weekend at that church. The church thought that they had really unlocked the code. And the guy was actively pursuing drug use and sexual sin and stealing from church members' homes to support his addiction. And like it always does, eventually that stuff came out. It was a giant mess. So as the guy who followed him, a big part of my job in the first couple of years there was to try to repair relationships with people that the guy burned. Rebuild trust. Now, I I walked into that situation knowing exactly what I was getting into. I signed up for it. I gladly signed up for it. But you know what would have been so, so much better for the cause of the gospel in that little community? If that church had never hired that guy in the first place. Their gospel witness in that community went backwards for a while. Backwards for a while. It took a very long time to to repair. More than 10 years later, there are still people in that small community who won't go anywhere near that church. 
But this isn't a story of some church leader who failed in sin and then the church had to figure out how to deal with it and try to respond graciously and all those kinds of things. No, the warning signs were there before they gave him the job. They were there. And they were there early on as things were ramping up. And, and those who had the ability to address it, instead of doing something about the problem, they dug the hole even deeper by justifying the lack of character because, well, I mean, look at all the success we're having. We're dunking kids every weekend, man. And they ignored it. And they did see results until it all blew up in their face. And then they learned that what they thought were results weren't actually results. Um, it was a surge of something that couldn't be sustained once the super charismatic guy on the pedestal wasn't there anymore to support it. Um, there had been a lot of decisions, there had been a lot of baptisms, but there hadn't been any real growth there. And to my knowledge, zero of those teenagers that had been processed through the spiritual programs of the church, none of them are still connected to a church today. Not even that, one, that, that church. What was excused for a while under the perception of, excess, of success ended up being the cause of incredibly terrible pain. A pain that likely will have eternity-sized repercussions. See, when given the opportunity... To clearly, define, to clearly define for Titus what he should be looking for when it comes to elevating church leaders, the Apostle Paul ignores every bit of what you and I tend to think are the most important things in a church leader. They ignore every bit of it. Instead, Paul hammers over and over and over again on character 17 times out of a list of 18 things. Why? Because those things don't matter because gifting and skill set and aptitude and training are, are entirely unimportant. No, not for a bit. It's because without quality of character, those other things are just as likely to be problems as they are assets. Without quality of character, those tools can just as easily be used to build personal, petty kingdoms as they are to, to be used to build God's kingdom. And so it's been my experience. I don't know about yours, but it's definitely been my experience that one of the biggest reasons people have often tend to view elders as the singular, standalone pastor figure is not is not because they're convinced of a certain interpretation of the biblical text they're aware of. It's usually because they think that there's some kind of high-level requirement for church leadership of training and charisma and skill set that they could never identify with. But when given the opportunity to actually make a list, Paul doesn't put those things on it. And he makes a similar list for Timothy in his letter. They ain't on that list either. To be clear, Men of unreproachable character is a lofty calling. And we're going to spend the next couple of weeks fleshing out just how lofty it actually is. But there's another thing that needs to be made perfectly clear here this morning. There's more than one guy in this room right now that fits the bill. Period. There's way more than one guy in this room right now who qualifies according to the actual list of qualifications. And right out of the gate, Paul tells Titus, go looking for men of character. Go find them. Raise them up. Appoint them. You've got some problems that you're dealing with in Crete? Awesome, I get it. That's why I left you on that island. Listen, you fix the problem by elevating qualified men who teach and shepherd and protect the flock. That's the answer to your problem, Titus. So whether we're talking about the Cretan church or we're talking about our own, what we need here is never more talent. God's given us plenty of talent. We're, all, we're fine. What we need here is never more talent. What we need is a resolve to continue elevating those who are humble. Men of lofty character. By God's grace, man, he's protected us from a lot of nonsense here. We should, we should definitely celebrate that. We should definitely celebrate that. But then right after celebrating that, we should also continue to further line up our systems and our structures with the pattern that we're seeing laid out clearly in the Bible. And I'm convinced that there are some things that we can shift to put us in a better spot. 
I'm also fully convinced that we'll have no problem getting there. I think God's leading us in this. But what about today, though? Right? Like, <laughs> how, how can we respond to, to God's word this morning? We looked at a, a verse and a quarter, right? Well, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, our response is the same as it is, as it is every single week. We repent of sin and we lean into what God is revealing about himself in the text, right? And this week, man, I think he's showing us that character, like, seriously matters. Character matters. Not because of some external standard of righteousness, righteousness, but because he himself is above reproach. I also think that he's showing us that he wants much bigger and better things for us, way bigger ambitions for the local church than what we often tend to aim at. When we fall back into pragmatic thinking on how things can be better run here, we usually create problems for ourselves that God would see us avoid. God's design for the church, the local church, is so much simpler than our designs, yet at the same time, it's also infinitely more profound than our best attempts at a plan. And sometimes the fix to our greatest problems is to actually get out of our own way and do it his more simple way. So just like last week, I think our response this morning probably needs to take the shape of thinking very deeply about what it is that we actually want to be here. Huh? What are we aiming at? What, what is it exactly that we think pastors and elders ought to be? How much do, do the secular systems of uh, our, our business and our politics and our culture influence the shape in, of those assumptions? And do those assumptions ever come into direct conflict with what the Bible actually says? And, and then thirdly, what's the next step forward once we realize that, that, that there's conflict there? What's our next move? I'm going to pray and we're going to sing. We want, we want to give you some space to respond to God's word in whatever way he might be leading you this morning. But what if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus yet? Like, I'm glad you're hanging out with us today. Um, you, you've walked into a, a, an extended family conversation, right? Kind of awkward for you, I don't know. All right, uh, here's what you need to absolutely understand and walk away with today, all right? And if you want to know, kind of boil it down to what we're talking about right now. If you're not a part of God's kingdom, not a part of this church, not even a follower of Jesus, all right? If, if, what do you need to learn today? It's this. We don't want to build an organization that tries to copy or match any earthly entity, Period. We're not aiming for specific metrics of growth or quarterly budget target. We want to build God's church by God's design in a way that accurately reflects God's character and ultimately points everybody else back to the beauty and surpassing value of God himself. That's what we're aiming at. Which means we will sometimes joyfully run the opposite direction than what might be considered successful in the world. And we do it on purpose. Why? Because we'd rather have the approval of Jesus. We think he's more valuable. Think he's a better prize. And we'd also love for you to meet him yourself. We want you to know him the way that we know him. The Bible teaches that all people by default are separated from God relationally because of our sin, that we are owed the just and righteous punishment for our sin. The Bible calls it God's wrath, calls it death, calls it hell. But the Bible also teaches that it is while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. The eternal Son of God, he put on flesh and he dwelt among us. He lived a sinless life that neither you nor I are capable of living. He died on the cross as a perfectly sufficient substitute in your place to make payment for your sin. And he was raised again from the dead as a vindication of his perfect and sufficient righteousness. And as the one who conquered sin and death, he calls on you this morning to respond to him in repentance and faith, to turn away from your sin and to turn to him as Savior and Lord. And you can do that this morning. You can respond to Jesus by meeting Jesus. I'd love to be helpful to you. I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. I'll be standing down there if you want somebody to talk to. We can work that out. Maybe you're here this morning, you need to respond in some other kind of way. Maybe it's by formally joining our church family, or maybe it's by uh, finally being obedient to Jesus in baptism, or maybe it's time to say yes to God's call in your life to take the gospel to some faraway place not named Nashua. I don't know. We'd love to be helpful to you in that regard, too. But whatever God's word is calling you to respond this morning, let's respond together right now. Father, you're good to us.
Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for Titus. We confess that we've got a lot of ideas about what churches ought to be and the best way they're run and we've got ideas about efficiency and purpose and goal and all of those things. But I'll confess that oftentimes those ideas, at least in my own heart, in my own head, they come from things other than your word. Call us to repentance on that. Help us to see your simple design. If there are things here that work well and that are structured as you please, let, let's celebrate your goodness to us in that. But if there are things here that, even if they work well, aren't structured as you would please, help us to change that. Help us to see clearly and have the kind of wisdom necessary to do it right. We're not smart enough to presume. We need, we need you to show us what to do. We're also confident in your goodness and the way you answer those requests. And so, would you help us? Show us the next step. Father, for those in here who don't know you yet, would you make yourself known even in this moment? Would you open eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to know you? Draw men and women into your kingdom this morning. Help us respond well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.